You're listening to Conversations with Shonda, a podcast and event series hosted by Shonda Smith Baker. Our guest today is Michael Vick, the famous former NFL quarterback who played with the Atlanta Falcons and Philadelphia Eagles. He shares with us his story through a tremendous rise, ball, and now he's taken action in prison reform and youth development. Enjoy the show. Thank you for being on uh, Conversations with Shonda. I was really motivated to talk to you after watching the 30 for 30. And there were a couple of things that really stood out to me watching your experience. My son played uh, D1 football. And I think that there are um, things that are so important about athletics and also really challenging for athletes. Right. And we often don't really understand the complexity of it. And so there was a comment or like I was really struck in part one about just the experience of you growing up in Newport News. And I'm, you know, sharing with you that I'm from North Minneapolis and thinking about like all the dreams in the hood, right? Of like getting out, you know, making it big. Um, It's all a dream. It's all a dream. All a dream. All a dream. Yeah, it's really really all a dream. I mean, it's it's unfortunate because, you know, um, Maybe half of the guys that I grew up with, I would say, uh, you know, maybe three quarters of the guys that I grew up with, um, 90% of us um, didn't have a dream and 10% of us had a dream. And, uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate because the environment we grew up in, it takes away from, you know, the opportunity to dream. Yeah. You know, so everything, uh, a dream don't really look like a reality when I, when I look back at it, you know, it's just, you know, the circumstances around us just make it feel like it's just too, too tough to overcome. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're an athlete at your caliber and as young as you were, you become the dream holder for a whole community. Right. Did you feel that pressure when you were young? Yeah, I did. I, I felt that pressure um, primarily because, you know, I, I I didn't want the pressure. You know, I I wanted to live the life of of a normal kid, and and that just wasn't. I mean, the, like when you grow up, you was, you want certain things. You see, you know, a couple of your other friends who might have uh, a little more than you. You you just start to go into these different places where. You know, it's, it's uncontrollable mentally. Um, and, and, you know, it's no therapy for it. You know, we don't get an opportunity to, to talk, you know, with our parents each and every day because they're going through struggle. They, they, you know, I mean, you talk, but, you know, the conversations just get lost, man. And, and I remember that. So, you know, I felt, I felt the pressure of just having to uh, change the surroundings of my entire family and, you know, I I looked at football as as a vessel. I, you know, I as a kid, I once I found out that you can make money playing football, it was like I'm like they make millions of dollars doing this. And then as I'm watching every game, I'm looking at every guy like he's rich, it's just off doing something that he loved to do, and I love to do it. So I was like, this is an easy path, but not really knowing that that path was going to consist of so many um, different obstacles and hurdles um, that I would have to overcome. Um, but but I did it, even though it wasn't the easiest, and I'll probably get into that later. Yeah, with so you know, I mentioned my sons, and one of the things that has always bothered me is when um, people lecture our young men, in particular, about their dreams of playing a pro pro ball, basketball, yeah. or football. Right? Like you know, it's such a small percentage that is sand, and they give you all the data points and. You know, I used to think, who are these dream snatchers that, you know, even if we know that the odds aren't in favor, we know that it's possible, right? Like if if that dream has them try harder in school, try, you know, work to get to college, you know, be dedicated to being in the gym and to hard work on the field. Why would we dilute that dream? And, And for people that do that, like, did that, was that motivating for you or... Yeah, it it was always motivating um, for me when when I felt like I had a little outside noise. Um, you know, even when I was you know thinking of you know these great things, I still had 
you know, people that I looked up to, people that was already established, you know, telling me that, um, you know, the position I wanted to play and, you know, the, the school that I was going to wasn't going to allow me to fulfill, you know, that dream or give me an opportunity to play in that position. I would automatically be switched to another position. And it was just difficult because, you know, you want motivation. You would think that, you know, your elders and, and you know, the people, you know, in your community who are community leaders would be pushing you and encouraging you. Uh, and in and, and the same breath, you know, they, they offering words of discouragement. And I'm like, man, you know, this is something I really have to do on my own. You know, once I turned, you know, 15, 16 years old, I knew that my destiny lied in my own hands. But, you know, I was just one of so many others that, you know, I, I, I stayed on the right track. The others, they, they fell into those traps and I just seen them just come and go. When I was watching the 30 for 30 and you, you go from Newport News and kind of carrying this weight and I'm, I'm watching like the way that you're being interviewed, right? Like, so this is how I interpret it. And this is uh, really sparked my curiosity is that you basically are ascending class, right? You're like not going from like poor and then you get the next job and then the next job and the next job and then you become a millionaire. You like go from like not having money and your family struggling, right? Public housing, can't have a dog, like sort normal sort of kid, the, right? Like the hood to like this $65 million contract, 64 million and then but you bring your friends with you, right? You you bring the responsibility and your commitment, right? And I think that's the the thing that um, I'm not sure people understand is that, again, you're holding the dreams, but you're also holding the responsibility of making sure you made a comment, like, I can't have $2 million and people I love are hungry. Yeah, I, I kind of had a, a, a mindset of, I, you know, I'd rather be broke together than rich alone. because. You know, for 18 years or for whatever, maybe, you know, 11 years, 11 hard years, you know, we had nothing, man. We pretty much had nothing. You know, all we had was the neighborhood. You know, we had the cookouts. Um, we had, uh, you know, the Boys and Girls Club. We had Pop One of Football and, and you know, a couple uh, convenience stores on the corner. That's it, you know, and, and didn't have any money to go in there and purchase anything, you know, if, you know, we didn't get it in a, a different manner. Um, and I always tried to stay away from that, you know, and I, I'll be candid. It's just, you know, the streets. Um, but, you know, my friends, they fell to the streets and, you know, I'm like, man, we we been so many, so many years we had nothing. And now all of a sudden, you know, I got something. I got some green. Like, come on, let's just go. Let's go have a good time. Like, God is good. You know, he's truly blessed us, us, you know, let's, let's find a way. We was young and, you know, when you get, you know, just being honest, you know, I mean, talking foot, real football numbers, you know, I mean, $14 million signing bonus, even still, you know, getting $3 million, like, you know, cause it was broken up still, I, I, you know, it's, it was just a lot of money. It, it was a lot of money and, it, and I had things that I wanted and I wanted to get and my friends did too. And, and my family, you know, my my immediate family, not just my friends, my my aunts and and um, you know my sister, uh, my cousins that I grew up with, females, um, you know, I all did I did something for every single every person, and you know I didn't exhaust myself because me and my mom was staying smart and we was cognitive of cognizant of you know what we had, you know we had to save. You don't know, you know, what the future holds. <clears throat> so instantly, once I got it, I was thinking about the future, but I was always already thinking about, um, you know, helping my people, you know, my family and putting a smile on their face. Yeah. So you you brought friends with you to Atlanta. Do you regret that at all? No, nah, you know, I don't I don't regret bringing my friends to Atlanta uh, because if my friends wasn't in Atlanta, I wasn't married. Um, I hadn't met uh, Kia for my wife. I met her like five months into my rookie season. So I was through my first season. And, you know, it wasn't about, you know, having my friends there just so we could, you know, just run wild in the streets. It, it was just an, another 
experience. So we go from, you know, uh, me getting a scholarship, playing in college. You know, they was up in Virginia Tech all the time, hanging out. We had a good time, never got in any, any trouble, wasn't troublemakers. We was just enjoying the moment. And then all of a sudden I get drafted and now we go from Virginia to Georgia. And we went together. I didn't, I didn't want to be there by myself. You know, I didn't know anybody, which it probably would have been the best thing for me because I probably got more out of my myself and my craft. But I just wasn't there at the time. You know, I'm I'm just being honest. And, you know, at 20 years old, when I first moved down there, I wasn't ready to take on a, a city like Atlanta by myself, nor did I feel like I was ready to um, – Playing the NFL, you know, I felt like I was still young, still green, uh, but I still had, but I had the talent. So they took me in um, with the premise of allowing me to just work my way in and and not play early, you know. So I didn't have a lot of added pressure. So my friends eased that pressure for me because you know the pressure mounted from being the number one pick in general. So you know sometimes I needed to laugh to keep from crying. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, I think that's important because a lot of times folks will see, especially our, our black athletes and be like, they got a whole posse with them. Like they say it in a way that I think is uh, judgmental, that lacks sort of the understanding of the complexity of that moment. Right. Like if I think about like, you know, my 20 year old going off to another city alone, just going off to college right. is enough. But to do that and to be on the cover of magazines and to have the level of scrutiny that comes with it. Yeah. It only makes sense that you would want to tighten up your circle of support and have them there to create the necessary balance. Now, I will say this. Whether you're 20 years old or 30 years old, when, you, when you're 30, you're obviously going to know more than, than what you know when you're 20 years old, um, 2021. So to a young up and coming athlete now, would I say the same thing? Would I give them the same advice? Take your friends. Would you take the people with you? No, I wouldn't do that. You know, I, I think it'll be a time in life where you can bring your friends along and, you know, more family, you know, possibly towards the end of your career. Because, you know, and even though they might not listen, I can explain to them just by example of what happened in my life, of how they can do it different, you know, and, and not, not let that be a distraction. Because most importantly, what's important is what happened on the field, even though I took care of what needed to happen on the field. You know, I still went home every Tuesday on my off day. I still wasn't in the building like I was supposed to be. I was young. I felt like I had arrived after my first year having success. And it was just, I just wish I would have stayed focused um, when I was young because that's when I was in my prime and that's when I was going to get the most out of my abilities. So I would advise a younger guy coming into the league now to, no, live by yourself. You know, you don't have to have a girlfriend. You don't have to, you know, you can have your teammates over. Get closer with your teammates. Get closer with the guys that's in that locker room. It's just going to save you a lot of money, save you a lot of time, and you can stay focused and be on the same page with them. That's what's most important. And then you have your off season where you can bring your friends in and then, you know, it's just a smarter way to do things. And, and I learned that, you know, just through experiences. Yeah. So if we talk about, so, you know, the dog fighting situation but what resonated with me is number one i didn't know it was illegal until you got in trouble because they were dog fighting up the street from where i lived kitty corner from where my grandma was like it wasn't a thing like you know i was a little timid child so it wasn't like something right. i was like down with necessarily but it wasn't something i would say i was necessarily either offended by or that for sure i didn't know it was something you could get in trouble with for yeah yeah. And so you talked about growing up and seeing that in your neighborhood, watching police drive by, just like I did. And then here you do, you, you find yourself in, in trouble. And it took you a while, it, it seemed, to um, identify with the depth of that, of what it meant, what it could mean. Yeah. Share a little bit about, I don't know, the, the route and in, into that. and Yeah. I, I, I just, you know, you, you grow up as a kid, you see so many things. So I, I mean, I can tell you like the things like I seen, you know, I seen people, I seen dead people. I seen, I seen more than what I was supposed to see growing up. Let's just say that as a kid, I seen way more than what I was supposed to see. And I seen things that I would never want my kids to ever see or have to endure because 
those things like haunted me, you know, and I, and I, and I still was, I was still living in, in that same place, that same environment. So, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm saying things that like, I'm giving me nightmares for three months and I can't sleep. And I'm thinking, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. And I'm also saying that I'm saying dog fighting and I'm, I'm saying fights and I'm saying shootouts and I'm whatever, you know, and then, and then I grow older and, this is something that we like, we just think is uh, like the norm, you know, um, even though I always felt like, you know, we was always trying to dodge the cops and stay out of the way. That's what we did when we got older. We tried to dodge the cops, stay out of the way, but now we're doing it with a lot of, you know, a lot of money. And, 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 and the, the funny part is that I, I probably said in my 30 for 30 is that, you know, even the whole time I'm doing it, I know it was wrong. You know, I'm like, I'm a grown man. I'm the face of a franchise and this is what I do, you know, when, you know, I walk out of that building, you know, so I always felt like, you know, not then, but I know now, you know, your character, you know, is exemplified by, you know, what you do when people are not looking. And, and, and so I, I know that now, but, but then I was just like, I'm, you know, it was the whole, you know, Mike Vick, nothing that happened to me. I'll be good. You know, and to a point where I was I was lying to my lawyers and not telling the truth to everybody and just going down the wrong path. Just because you have money and you have success, and you have some fame and you can have anything you want. Don't mean that you can still break the rules and, and break the law um, to whatever capacity. And, and you know, it is unfortunate that at that juncture in my life, I had to learn things the hard way, you know, and. Like, yeah, I'd be upset because of what I went through. And, and you know, sometimes I feel like, man, I, you know, with this person, they get in trouble for this. This person, and, you know, it don't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, when you're on a platform like I have, if, if, if they want to punish me the way they punish me, my life would have never changed. I feel like my life is I love where I'm at as a person. Um, you know, when I went to prison at 27 years old, you know, I came out at 29, a totally different person, a better person, um, mentally, physically stronger, um, you know, was always been introverted in my life. You know, uh, you know, shy kid, um, you know, I feel like, you know, some of the things that I went through in my life made me that way. Uh, real reserve, take a long time to get to gain my trust. But when I came out, I was just like, you know, I'm changing all that. I want relationships with my coaches, teammates, some of my friends got to go. You know, it, it was a real in-depth dive into, you know, reality. And, uh, you know, I started to change all that. And then those same people started helping me change as a person and helped me grow and gave me more confidence. And I'm like, and so, you know, even as an NFL player, I was still dealing with a lot, man, that I, that I love to talk about now because it's therapeutic. But, you know, I still like to you know, look back and, 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 you know, look at the road travel, you know, and then can wake up in the mirror now and, and be proud of, of what I see. Yeah. Because that's where it starts. Yeah. I know it wasn't your imagined path, but for you to, to go to prison at 29, come out or 27, come out at 29, and you're saying you came out as a better person. Um, what were there people inside that helped you with that? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, you know, got to give a lot of credit to, you know, the guys in there for for just keeping me strong. You know, there was times where I was weak and broke down and they seen it like vulnerable. I never forget it was a guy named Mr. Harlan, um, OG Mr. Harlan that was just, you know, um, one time I lost my grandmother. My, Matt Ryan got drafted by the Falcons same day. Just a weird, weird day overall. And, and I never forget being out on the track and he came and caught me on the track and I'm out there tears crying. And he just made me feel better. And then I had guys encouraging me, you know, even when I filed bankruptcy. And I'm like, bro, is this real? I'm like, man, look, I'm in here. So I like to tell you. And, you know, it was just, they always had that belief in me. Like, when you get out, you go and do, you go do, the things that you set out to do and, and you shouldn't be here. They not always, everybody always just felt like, man, you shouldn't be here. But I'm like, well, I'm here and, and I'm just like, y'all, so we can't change that. So let's not talk about that. But they pushed me and helped me and they encouraged me. And, um, yeah. you know, what I found out about prison, man, is everybody in there is not bad people. 
Um, you know, everybody want to get out. You know, everybody want better for their lives. We all, a lot of us was in there because, well, most of them was in there because they wanted better. And and the only way they knew how to do it was the way that they've been educated to do it their whole life. And that was the wrong way. So, I, yeah. I but, appreciate that. I just, I just lost my mother. And um, my mom, my mom would say, I know, basically, I know you think you're smart. I want you, I want you to understand there are smart people in jail. There are brilliant people in prison. Yeah. Right. The reason that they're there is because they had a different circumstance. Right. Right. right? Like, don't ever think you're smarter or better. Yeah. Right? You just have the support system that has nurtured you in a different way. Right. And I think that now that we're like looking at like prison reform and other things, I think that we have created the monster that lives in jail and dehumanize them. Right. And, um, you know, I, I love, I love the stories of, um, redemption, right. The stories of life that when people are able, because you can't really move something, move through something. If you identify with what, what's wrong with you. Right. Yeah. If, if you don't identify, then, I mean, it's, it's like your lost soul. You know, you got to be able to look in the mirror and like what you're looking at. And and it's times when people look in the mirror and don't like what they see. And it's times where you just driving and self-consciously you think about where you are in your life and what you're about to do. Or you might be about to do something that's, you know, just got malice written all over it in its own way. And you're like, damn, I shouldn't be doing this, but... I'm going to just do it this last time just to get, you know, it, it won't happen again. And then it happen again and again and, and becomes repetitive. Mm-hmm. Like you, you really got to take onus, you know, of your life and, and, and take accept responsibility for your daily actions. Like my lawyer <laughs> told me one time and, and this, I never forget this, this stuff, like, he was like, you can go 23 hours in a day doing the right thing and you can slip up in that last hour. And that's all people are going to remember. And he said that one day and he was he, he's like the he's like the the uh, the guru of cliches, man. He, he, he pulled some stuff out. But this one, sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's a little boring and dull, but it's all, it always got truth written all over it. And that one hit home. So, you know, I try to live by that mantra and 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 you know, just try to try to take every day one day at a time, hour by hour, minute by minute. Yeah. For the um, for your sentencing, which was a whole thing, right? Like there's sentencing reform that should happen in the criminal justice re- um, yeah. reforms all over the place. But it really broke down by racial lines. And we continue to see that. And, you know, I started out, you know, talking a little bit about George Floyd um, as we were uh, introducing ourselves. And, you know, criminal justice reform is such a big topic right now. Is oh, this yeah. something that you've involved yourself in at all, or or do you have comments or positions on where that sits? Yeah, so I'm starting my own prison reform program um, <clears throat> with the help of a lot of different people, um, you know, from Arthur Blank to the NFL, um, who are going to support, you know, what I'm trying to do. You know, I am prison reform, uh, and and when I spoke to them about it, I, you know, I, I tried to illustrate the best way I could that. You know, you guys helped reform me, you know, without them, I wouldn't have had a chance to, you know, get back out on the field and, you know, provide for my family. Like, I don't know what I would have done. Um, and, you know, I always wanted to be in the criminal justice department and, and my, you know, if I didn't play the NFL, I wanted to um, be a um, FBI agent. So <laughs> coming from prison, there wasn't a way to go do that. You know, that would have just, so, so they, so they helped me in that regard. So now I want to just help as many as those guys. We just talked about it, you know, very bright, competent guys want more for themselves and their families. They don't want to do it the wrong way. They want to do it the right way, but in doing that, you just need the opportunity. And I just want to create that opportunity through housing, transportation, job opportunities, uh, so many things that we can help them with. And the more of us doing it, the better. Uh, so I know a lot of people who are heavily involved in that field and, and just want to connect with them and, and, you know, bring some things to life, man. So I, I'm, I'm excited about the opportunities that I have in prison reform and the people that I'm going to be working with. Yeah. How do you um, how do you resonate with the defund the police movement? Okay, so explain that to me. <laughs> um, what that what that is? 
Well, so I will tell you how it has been interpreted, right? Because I don't think that there's um, a uniform definition, but the way that I understand it is essentially reducing the budget of policing to um, move those dollars to resources like mental health services, employment services, chemical dependency services, um, I think it's a uh, an effort to stop over criminalization and to um, to so, respond with the needs of the community. Yeah, but but also within the police force, it'll cut budgets, cut their budgets. Yep. And um, you know, so so I, I mean, I I'm hearing what you're saying, and I definitely have mixed emotions in regards to that. I believe in helping people, and I believe that people need help. Uh, people also got to help themselves. Um, but I also believe that, you know, we all got to stay safe, too. And somebody got to be willing to, to do that. Unfortunately, it's like it's like it's like football, man. You know, you know, at some point you're going to get injured. You know, at some point you're going to get hit hard enough that it's going to take a toll on you and, and you're not going to be able to recover from it. But, you know, 90 percent of the plays, you make it through, you make it through. And and I feel like that's, you know, that's kind of where we are, you know, as a country in terms of how we look at police and, and, and what's happened, you know, over the last year or two years or, or over a long period of time has been so unfortunate and, and it's so out of our control um, that, you know, I stand, you know, on the side of, you know, trying to understand why, you know, these things are happening. And and I think we all, you know, like pull our heads out trying to figure out why is this happening at an all-time rate, uh, you know, and sometimes it's ignorance, sometimes, you know, it, you know, it's on both sides, you know, um, but at the end of the day, damn, we still need people to help, you know, serve in our community, to help keep the community safe, to, you know, so it's, it's always going to be mixed emotion with that. We got people need help. You know, so it, it is no right or wrong answer yeah. um, to, to that question. You know what I'm saying? We we just got to continue to help educate people, educate, um, you know, I, I guess the police force. Like we was even talking uh, some of the Atlanta Falcon guys, alumni, uh, work done, you know, leading the charge, you know, in terms of, you know, going and speak to, you know, guys in the police force. How can we help? What can, like, let's talk through scenarios. Let's, you know, if a guy comes and he look, he's in the, dressed in black, what are you thinking? You know, we need to get messages out there so people can be alarmed on both sides. Like, yeah, I'm afraid of him and he in fear of me, but, you know, they, they hold, you know, they hold the, the weapons, you know, and, you know, so so it, it'll never be a right or wrong answer, man. We just got to find some common ground. Yeah. So in in the in the football example, you have you know ninety percent of the plays, right? You have the, the the one play that can take you out of the game. Yeah. I think that I think the problem in policing is like the one play that in someone's life doesn't in fact take them out of the game, right? And I think and I appreciate you leaning into the complexity of the issue. Uh, because I think it is complex. I'm sitting in a community. So complex. It's so complex. I'm sitting in a community right now. They're shooting stuff up every day, right? Like, I mean, the the crime is just surging, and I want to make sure me, my kids, my family, my community is safe. Yeah. And I expect a response if someone breaks in my house. Right. But I don't expect for someone to end up dead if I'm calling for help. And right. And, both, right. and I think that the 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 truth is is that you can hold all of those things. They're both true. And we got to yeah. figure out how to move move it to the best place so we do the yeah, cause, right because you don't want people taking actions to their own hands. Somebody breaking your house, you're like, I ain't calling the police. I'm gonna just do it myself. Then you you know you there's it, it, so many circumstances to come along with that. First yeah. thing you think, I'm gonna call the police. Police show up, they shoot somebody. Like it, it's just it becomes a whole barrage of this is an avalanche of negative. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it's, it's no way to gauge it. The only people that can be able to help is the, the people who have a voice, you know, community leaders, athletes, entertainers who step up and, you know, let their actions speak louder than words. You know, I, I'm, I'm wrapped out. No more talking. I don't want to, I'm not talking about that. I'm being about it. And, and, uh, you know, 
it, it's up to us to lead by example. You know, we, we got a voice. You know, look at all the athletes encouraging people to vote. Now the whole world is all into voting all of a sudden. And, you know, it's paying dividends, you know, so the same energy that we bring to, you know, certain issues is the same issue we got to bring to all issues, you know, same energy. Yeah, let's talk about voting. Restore the vote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I heard you got some good news going on in your life around that. Yeah, yeah, I just, um, you know, I've been able to exercise my right to vote again. Um, but I think I always had a chance to, I just wasn't educated on it. I found out through more than a vote, what it took. Um, shout out to my man, Desmond Mead, uh, to the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. You know, they educated me and, and, and it was a really cool process to go through that because <clears throat> just like everybody else, I re- never really paid attention to it. I, I, I felt like my vote didn't count. It wouldn't matter. And this year I was just like, you know, I want to be involved, you know, um, and when I seen what LeBron James was doing, I was like, look, man, I would love to get involved in that, what they got going on. And I always pay attention to, to the things that everybody's doing. I'm always reading. So if you don't think I know, I probably do. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was a really cool um, opportunity. And I, want, I wanted to move on it, you know, that my team was able to execute. They hooked it up. And, uh, I, you know, we got a whole blog about it, man, and the whole process, which is cool. So people probably can go uh, find it at more than the vote.com. Okay. Well, we'll make sure to post that with the podcast. Um, and so it's something that uh, our foundation is really working on and supporting is making sure that we're restoring the vote, the opportunity to vote to people that have lost it because of their criminal background. Nice. Um, they've served their time. They need to be able to fully participate in ways that they, they want to, which should at least be an option on the table. Yes. Yes, for sure. Now nah, everybody should take part in it, man. It's, um, you know, because, you know, for generations to come, we dictate how this world is going to move. You know, uh, the, the leaders in charge and how they think. And, you know, it's, it's a way for us to have a voice. So, you know, we, we have a chance to express ourselves in so many different ways. We just don't do it. And, uh, you know, the door is always open. We just got to walk through it. Yeah. Do you know what what of because um, there's a lot of folks in community that aren't that aren't growing up with sort of the idea that their voice matters when they vote. Like, do you think that there would have been anything in your younger years that would have had you see that differently? Like if it came no. from, you know, no, I'm be honest. No, yeah. it wouldn't have because, you know, when you grow up in poverty stricken areas, you're like, okay, I'll go vote or your, your parents probably like, okay, I'll go vote. And then what is that going to do for us? You know, in the next three months, it's not going to change our situation. Like people got to vividly see what's going to happen. Okay. I'm going to have an increase in my monthly, um, you know, check from, yeah, like, like my monthly, uh, you know, resources of money from, you know, $800 to $1,500. If I vote for this guy and he get in office, all right, now people are going to be running to the post. They, they need help. But when they don't see an incentive in it, you know, they usually stay stagnant and, uh, you know, they'd rather go out and, and, and spend time talking to their friends next door than, than uh, going down to vote. So I, I think you got to paint a vivid picture for everyone and, uh, you know, not keep them confined into, you know, where they at, you know, asking for their vote, but not making their vote count. Don't make sense. Mm-hmm. Let's spend the last couple of minutes because there are going to be people, no doubt, that are just going to be like Mike Vick and the dang on dog fighting. Right. I get that. What's that? Um, the dog fighting piece, right? Like, what about it? Well, I just think that there are people that are just stuck there, right? And I know you don't want to give them a lot of air, and and I can appreciate that. But you know, is is there a point where you feel like people can be really or thoroughly redeemed, and and do you depend on people that don't under, understand your story to be the redemption, the redemptors, whatever the word is? No, nah, well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I just look at my life and where I'm at. Like, I have so many great people in my life who, uh, you know, they they know me personally, and, and you know, I think that's all that matters. Like, I, I felt like I can't go through life trying to please the whole world. Like, and you know, I'm just one individual. You know, so Let me why is everybody you. being so hard on me? Like, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to understand like your question. Yeah, let me rephrase it, because what I want, what I ultimately want people to um, uh, hear when they listen to this is 
you've made different decisions coming out and you stay committed to the word that you had, right? Like you're going out and you're talking to young people about why dog fighting is wrong. But right. aside from that, you're really talking to them much broader about their character yeah. um, and all of these things. And and if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that commitment, that's a better way of yeah, it, yeah, no doubt. I, I totally understand. So, so I use that platform, which, um, you know, me being convicted of interstate commerce, um, you know, for, for dog fighting. I, I use that platform to teach young kids like, look, now, you know, if, if you're in if you're in the neighborhood and you're doing that, I hate saying in the hood, if you're growing up and you're doing that. Then, then now you can go to you can go to jail for it. It's, it's different laws. You know, they look at it different. You know, um, you know, you got to have a different love and appreciate. You got to have a love and appreciation for animals. Um, you got to show empathy. You got to have it, you know, sincerely. And if not, you can go to jail for it. I myself have taken part in in changing laws, help pass laws. Uh been to been to Capitol Hill a couple of times. You know, we got the hot dog law where you can't keep a dog in, in the car that's over like 70 degrees. Um and then we got um uh the felony spectator act where you can't even if you're a spectator at a dog fight, you'll still get a felony if you're caught in that act. So, like, I worked diligently to help change laws because I just wasn't educated. And I didn't know, and I don't want kids falling into that same trap, thinking they could do it, thinking they could spectate on it, and, you know, for the overall well-being of animals, I wanted to take part in that. That being said, I also wanted to educate kids on the importance of decision-making. And I felt like, you know, I made bad decisions, it's evident. Look at what I went through. But you don't have to make those same decisions. Like you can, you can make the right. You're not gonna always make the right decision. But you know, if you can go through life and you know, if you like 95 percent accurate on a day to day basis on the decisions you make and totally think them through, then then that's what you have to do. It, it, you know, it takes a lot. It's it's a strain. You know, it takes a lot. Uh, it's a you know on your on your on your mental. Uh, it takes a toll uh, away from. You know, you just being able to function on a day to day because so many things get thrown at so many people and it's hard to it's hard to gauge sometimes. But you 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 control your own destiny, you know, and and I wanted to speak to kids all across the country and educate them, not just only on, you know, uh, dog fighting and what not to do, but just, uh, you know, having a greater perspective in life on what to do. And, uh, you know, the future leaders of our country, man, you know, so, you know, I'm taking it upon myself to educate the youth, help them, not just talk to them. You know, you're trying to, you know, continue to, you know, we want to restore community centers, boys and girls clubs, um, refurbish them, uh, renovate them, give kids a platform, a place where they can go and hang out and not run the streets. You know, so I'm doing a little bit of everything just so, you know, I'm not just talking, you know, I'm letting my actions speak louder than my words. Yeah. That's the way I can. And I'm just one person. I, I hear that. And I think that's what it's about is how do we all lean in and how do we support people when they need it? Which is my very last question, because your wife was holding you down. She 100 percent believed in you. Your mom, yeah. you were able to call. I mean, Tony Dungy, right? Like he was in Minnesota, right? An incredible yeah. man of character that that seemed to like I mean, he came, he visited you. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Was, can you was, just like, can you just give a shout out to the importance of like having people that just show up? Yeah, I, I think in life, man, when you uh, first of all, shout out to all the people you just named, Tony Dungy, my wife, uh, Roger Goodell, my man. I always forget to talk about my man, Kevin Winston, uh, director of player personnel with the Atlanta Falcons. Like he was so instrumental in just my like my uh, like I think my heart's still beating because of this dude. You know, and, and just him coming to visit me in Kansas and, and, and Leavenworth and, you know, even just just staying connected with me over the years. We still have a great relationship to this day. He's still with the Atlanta Falcons and um, close to Arthur Blank Coast with the organization, but he don't get enough credit. I feel bad I didn't shout him out in the 30 for 30, but, you know, he low key. He know he good. Um, my wife was amazing. I couldn't have done it without her. Um, her support was just uncanny and through the roof. She totally leaned in and made sure that I was comfortable every step of the way. Couldn't have did it without her. Uh, Tony Dungy came in at the end. Not at the end, but throughout the process and just made sure mentally I was healthy and, and I was ready to come out and, and, and tackle all the things that I was about to face 
Andy Reid and Roger Goodell was just, they two men in my life that I'd never forget. Um, or, or, or always, they can call me for anything. You know, the, anything they need, anything they ever need from me, they can call me, not because of what they did, but because of the man that they are. Um, they really care. You know, Coach Reed spent a lot of time just talking to me and, and, and building me back up. Um, Roger, the first thing he ever told me when I came out of prison was, you know, I'm not here to talk about the past. I'm here to talk about moving forward. That was all I ever had to hear from him. And, and like, um, you know, his personality, this is the main of being around him is, is infectious, just like Andy. And, you know, probably be remiss if, if, um, if I don't say, uh, you know, Arthur Blank, you know, Arthur was, you know, the first person to come visit me when I came home, even though they moved on with another quarterback, still was there for me. Um, I still call him to this day if I need a favor for anything. I don't use him unless I need him, but I just have <clears throat> so much respect for him and, and his family and, and what he represents to the uh, to the Atlantic community, to the state of Georgia, to the NFL. And um, yeah, and you came out broke, right? So people helped you, right? Because like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, broke and they so, don't I mean, stories are told like, like, um, T.I. gave me $50,000 when I came home. I had no money. Like, T.I. gave me the most money that, T.I. gave me $50,000, man. And, and, and to this day, I still try to give it back to him and he won't take it. <laughs> like, he really, he, he won't. Like, ah, man, he give me, you know what I mean? So, it's people like him, like, you know, so shout out to T.I. Like, people like that, man, like, they do things with a willingness to just help people, man. And I don't think they get enough credit. I don't get enough credit for it, but those are the same people that are still on top to this day and and, and men of great character. So, um, you know, everybody played a part, man, and I wouldn't be here without the people I just named. There's probably some more, and I'm sorry if I didn't mention everybody, but they, they know who they are. Well, look, I want to I wanna thank you for spending uh, this, this hour with me. And, you know, there's so many lessons that can be learned uh, through your life. And so I, I deeply um, appreciate your willingness to share it and to be open. I think that, you know, people that have not grown up in the neighborhoods with the challenges that so many of us have faced don't understand yeah. the obstacles to overcome. Right. They think that their worldview is, is our worldview, that that we're navigating um, spaces and places and lessons in the same way we're not you know, your ability to kind of, you know, really just focus on who do you need to be, not the circumstances, right? To like transcend right. transcend your own disappointment, right? Like transcend yeah. that in a very public way. And then I think for the listeners, like being able, just the story and the, and the commitment of, of your circle around you to your success. There are right. people coming out every day out of jail with negative bank accounts, right? Owing money to the state for child support, no place to live, yeah. no circle of friends that are going to pull them out. And so there are so many ways that we can um, provide a safety net and an opportunity for people to redeem themselves and, and to really show their character that wasn't able to shine because of the circumstances and their choices. Right. right. I appreciate you. No doubt. Thanks for having me. Have All fun. right. Yeah. Right. Have a good day. No doubt. That's Michael Vick and our host, Shonda Smith-Baker. If you haven't seen our new fabulous website, head over to conversationswithshonda.org. On behalf of the Minneapolis Foundation, and as I place my hand over my heart, we just want to say thank you for your support. We hope you've been enjoying our guest and the conversations. This is Sue Pak Kienitz from the Minneapolis Foundation. Stay safe out there. And thank you for listening to Conversations with Shonda.